Welcome to the Naval Postgraduate School Center for Homeland Defense and Security Lecture and Webinar Series. On behalf of CHDS and our co-host today, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, the International Association of Emergency Managers, the National Emergency Management Association, the National Governors Association, the CHDS Alumni Association, and the Naval Postgraduate School Alumni Association and Foundation. Thank you for joining us. In today's discussions, our panel will address what local and state leaders might expect next in the U.S. response to COVID-19, including the latest developments in vaccine expansion for youth populations, challenges in maintaining a resilient healthcare workforce, and mm -hmm. in-game strategies for the pandemic. Thank you for joining us today as we explore collaboration opportunities for Homeland Security, emergency management, public health and public safety officials in the months to come. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's webinar. Jim Blumenstock is the Senior Vice President for Pandemic Response and Recovery at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, or ASTO. Jim's responsible for the coordination and oversight of all of the association's COVID-19 pandemic activities. And Jim has also served as the Chief Program Officer for Health Security at ASTO. Prior to that, he worked with the New Jersey State Department of Health and Senior Services for over 30 years. And he's bringing today an extraordinary amount of expertise in moderating today's discussions. Jim, thank you for serving throughout COVID and throughout your career, and thank you for moderating today. We'll now turn the program over to you to introduce our panel. Well, thank you, Don, and certainly I certainly appreciate those very kind remarks, and welcome, everyone. You know, since the public health emergency was declared on January 31st, 2020, we experienced an unprecedented response to this global crisis, both in intensity and all hands and all of nation response, duration, 21 months and counting, and of course, the consequences. This time last month, COVID-19 reached the notoriety of being the deadliest pandemic in American history, surpassing the death toll of the devastating 1918 flu pandemic. Today, the death toll is at 734,000 individuals with 45 million cases being identified, also resulting in 3.2 million confirmed hospitalizations. The COVID era has also caused significant disruptions in how we work, learn, earn, communicate, and socialize. On top of that, concerns continue to grow as information becomes available about delayed or chronic post-COVID conditions, also referred to as long or long haul COVID, and our health debt. Health debt is the accumulated impact of changes in behaviors and conditions during the pandemic that will have long-term negative effects on health. And this would include such things as delayed or missed prevention screenings, delayed treatment of existing diseases, foregoing chronic disease management activities, and unfortunately, substance abuse. Even today, we hear and see hospitals being swamped with patients that are not infected with COVID, but where COVID is a contributing factor. Hospitals are not only seeing more patients, but they are sicker. On the flip side, we have made significant strides to win the battle. We have proven strategies and tools at work. At the top of the list are three safe and effective vaccines authorized for use in various age and risk groups, layered mitigation approaches such as masking, distancing, and, and improved ventilation controls, as well as new therapeutics, including monoclonal antibodies and antivirals. We are again at a pivotal moment in our response. We may be at a turning point or uh, turning the corner. Um, cases and hospitalizations continue their decline, a fraction of what they were six to seven weeks ago. And we have successfully administered over 430 million doses of vaccine, resulting in 57% of the U.S. population being fully vaccinated. However, I cannot yet say that the end is near. There is no doubt about it that there is significant disease out there still, with 70,000 new cases being diagnosed each day. In addition, we face other challenges. Our citizenry is COVID fatigued and appearing to become more and more polarized by the day on their opinions, their positions, and their actions. Our public health and healthcare workforce is battle-worn. Our healthcare system is at a very fragile state. And as a society, we are seeming to increasingly um, exhibit and act uh, elements of incivility. 
All of this when we also must keep our eye on other real threats to our health security, seasonal flu, natural disasters, cyber terrorism, and the list can certainly go on. So today together, our goal is to ex examine these issues in more detail. What will the next couple of months have in store for us? And how will this, that short horizon be in Harbinger for the year ahead? To help us, uh, we have assembled an outstanding panel of four leaders representing the public health, public safety, and education sectors. Let's meet them. First, we have A.J. Gary. In June 2016, Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson appointed A.J. as the director of the Arkansas Depart Department of Emergency Management and the State Homeland Security Advisor. A.J. also serves on the Arkansas Safe Schools Committee, Arkansas's Governor's Earthquake Advisory Council, the State Emergency Response Commission, and in leadership roles in the Arkansas Wireless Information Network. From 2020 to 2021, A.J. served as the chair of the Governor's Homeland Security Advisory Council, the GSAC, their executive committee, and has also chaired the Arkansas 911 board and served on the board of directors for the Central United States Earthquake Consortium. Next, we have Dr. LaQuandra Nesbitt. Dr. Nesbitt is a board certified family physician with over a decade of experience leading population health initiatives in governmental public health agencies. Dr. Nesbitt currently serves as the director of the District of Columbia Department of Health in Washington, DC, a position that she, had held, she has held since January, 2015, when appointed by Mayor Muriel Bowser. As a physician leader, Dr. Nesbitt has mobilized organizations and communities to implement innovative solutions to promote health and wellness and achieve health equity. Prior to her role in DC, Dr. Nesbitt served as the director of the Louisville Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness, where she led initiatives focused on Affordable Care Act implementation and violence pre prevention. Our third panelist is Dr. Lee Norman. Dr. Norman is the secretary of the Kansas Department of Health and the Environment, appointed by Governor Laura Kelly. After serving in the US Air Force as a family physician, flight surgeon, and combat medical instructor, he practiced medicine in Seattle for 20 years and also served as a clinical associate professor at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Norman has served as a chief medical officer for over 26 years, most recently at the University of Kansas Health System and before that at the Swedish Health System in Seattle. He is currently a clinical assistant professor at the University of Kansas School of Medicine. And our fourth panelist is Chris Reichdahl. Um, Chris is the Superintendent of Public Instruction for the State of Washington. In this role, he supports the state's 295 school districts and nine educational service districts, administering education programs for more than 1 million students. Throughout his career, Superintendent Reichdahl has focused on ensuring that all learners have equitable opportunities for a high quality public education. As superintendent, Chris has also worked to reinvigorate career and technical education pathways for students, spearheading an, overall, an overhaul of Washington's graduate graduation requirements to provide students with multiple pathways to a high school diploma that are aligned to their goals and interests. So certainly I sure, I'm sure you would all agree with me, four outstanding individuals in their own right. And today um, they are our strong panel that we will have a conversation with. Um, I, as, as our approach, I have a few questions I do want to pose to, to the four of them individually and collectively. Um, and if we manage our time right, we will certainly uh, give you all ample opportunity to interact with the panel, um, to share your questions or your thoughts as well. So my first question, I really, again, Laquandra and Chris, thank you so much for being with us. Um, and I want to direct this to you. And it's the news of the day. Um, you, we have, we've accomplished one major step forward. Um, and making pediatric vaccines available for our children, our very precious resource with the FDA Advisory Committee uh, approving that step yesterday. So for public health departments and schools, just how critical is this in stemming the tide of the pandemic? Is it really a game changer as people uh, some, somehow or often refer to it as? And you know, what, is your what is your sense of public acceptance, acceptance to this? And what are, have been some of the key readi readiness steps your agency has taken in preparing for this campaign. Laquandra, let's start with you. Thanks, Jim, uh, for the question. And, and thanks again for the opportunity uh, to be here and to share with so many folks uh, 
um, about the pandemic and sort of where we're going. And I'll, I'll have some commentary about that when we get into that part of the panel. You know, it's, it's been a tremendous opportunity for us to be able to have the conversation about the pediatric vaccines and being able to vaccinate the 5 to 11 group. Uh, both public health and, and the education sector have been keenly interested in what we can do to help our young people uh, learn and learn in person. Uh, we all have a collective shared commitment uh, to resuming the educational experience that all of our young people were having before uh, March of 2020. Uh, we are all very concerned about the social and emotional uh, development of our young people uh, and how that links to in-person learning experience, uh, as well as some of the academic losses we know young people have had uh, as a result of the pandemic. Uh, one of the things that we know is that uh, our current public health guidance and recommendations are rooted in uh, more benefits for people who are fully vaccinated. Uh, and because we don't have vaccines that are currently available for people under the age of 12, our young people who are exposed to COVID-19, not just those who are infected, but who are exposed to COVID-19, uh, often have additional uh, missed opportunities for in-person education. Uh, so having vaccines approved for the five to 11 year old population uh, will accrue not only benefits to their physical health, but will also accrue benefits for their social and emotional health, uh, reducing the amount of time that they may miss from school uh, due to quarantining, um, et cetera. So we're, we're very uh, excited about that. Um, we do know uh, that parents still have a lot of questions. Uh, we've had a huge ground game, uh, not only in DC, but across the country. Uh, working with healthcare providers, pediatricians, family docs, uh, trying to answer the questions that parents have with the information that we currently have available to make sure as many parents and families are ready uh, as soon as vaccines are approved to get their children vaccinated. Uh, so we can not only have the greatest benefit to those children individually, uh, but to our communities as a whole. Now, we've also been working to get as many providers who typically provide vaccines to children uh, in our community, we have about 70% um, of those providers who participate in our Vaccines for Children program have already signed up to offer vaccines to uh, five, COVID vaccines uh, to five to 11 year olds. Uh, and we want to work with the schools. Uh, so public health and schools are working together to be able to offer those COVID-19 vaccines on site. Uh, so we're all getting very excited about the promise of next week. Um, what this means for being able to protect even a larger share of our population uh, with vaccination as a way of helping us to end this pandemic. Laquandra, well, thanks so much. So Chris, let's turn to you. You know, we're talking about 28 million children. Um, you know, certainly you're the, the segment of the population that your districts serve, and you have a little bit of experience of recognizing that um, we mobilized to do adolescent uh, vaccination a little while back. So you have a little bit of, a, of an opportunity to learn and grow from that experience. Can I ask you to share um, your thoughts on this particular topic? Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Dr. Nesbitt, for kicking this off here. Um, the state of Washington, you know, it's a little bit unique. Uh, I, I will say all of my remarks are in the context of a state that's nearly 80% uh, vaccinated with at least one dose and 72 or 73% fully vaccinated. So. We are a state that in large part has really embraced this. And I know um, it's a different sort of uh, embrace around the country and I wanna be respectful of that. What we saw in our youth ages 12 and older uh, was an acceptance rate, like you might expect uh, a group of folks, 30 or 40% of our population that age immediately embrace it. Um, and then it's taken us a long time for those numbers to inch up as folks have gotten information and kind of done their due diligence. But quite frankly, when we look at our state, our most vaccinated population is 80 and over and then 65 to 79. And the vaccination rate actually declines through the age demographics consistent with sort of this messaging, right or wrong, of you're, you're less likely to get it, you're less likely to be impacted, you're less likely to be hospitalized or, or, or face some mortality. Unfortunately, with that logic, there's a lot of young people who say, I don't need this. And what we would say to everybody is, um, we need this. It is good public health and it is good for the individual. So we're gonna, we're gonna be very active in trying to promote the vaccine. I think the mobility of mass clinics that we saw for adults and our adolescents probably won't bear out the same way. One thing I would have folks across the country think about is 
you're talking about little kids, there's a protection factor emotional for, for parents. They need to be there on site with them. Um, so it is much more likely based on some, some work that's being done in our state and others, to, in our understanding, that families are going to want their local pediatrician, their local doctor, some trusted individual to consult with and do this. We expect a lot more vaccine in five to 11 year olds to move through doctor's offices than we saw the mass clinics. We have districts prepared for it in your states. Uh, I think folks will approach it a little differently. There still may be some uh, mass vaccination opportunities. There will be some school districts and education facilities who take that up. In some places, that's not something they want to do um, from a risk standpoint, but more importantly, just a political standpoint. So I expect this to roll out a little differently. I expect those numbers not to be overwhelming in the beginning, uh, maybe 30 or 40 percent in the first four weeks. And then I do think we'll see that continue to inch up, would encourage everybody to do it. Uh, the last thing I'll say is um, there's going to be a new urgency to taking down the other mitigation measures as the headline news of more people eligible for vaccine comes along. And I would cautious us all to be careful about that. Um, if we were at 90% vax rate or something based on the public health officials we talked to, it'd be a different story. But but it, even in a state like ours, we're only approaching 80. We've got youth only at 60 or 70% vaccinated. Five to 11 year olds will be a lower number. We still have a lot of risk. This, this is nowhere near done. So face coverings in a state like ours will continue. Um, all of those hygiene practices, uh, the air, transfers, all of that is going to matter. And one thing we'll all have to guard against is the headline news of now virtually everyone age five and older being eligible. Can we start taking down these other things? And the answer would be that would be terrible. We saw us react too soon in states and regions around the country. Um, when we thought alpha was coming down before Delta, as we saw vaccines for adults, we, we took things down too quickly and, and we actually helped fuel something uh, worse. So I, I caution everyone to be careful about that presumption. You know, thank you, Chris and, and LaQuandra. I mean, that, that last point certainly is spot on. I mean, that is going to be certainly not only the, the narrative um, that we'll be engaging in, but it also has significant public policy and decision considerations going forward. So thank you for raising that. And we probably could come back to that when we sort of talk a little bit more about sort of the, uh, the exit strategy approaches of getting back to normal. Uh, next, again, LaQuandra, to you as well, um, and, and AJ. Um, you know, we want to sort of transition to a conversation about the impact of employer vaccination mandates on, on the workforce and the provision of services, such as healthcare and public safety and, and certainly other critical infrastructures. You know, what has been your experience and what contingencies are being considered or put in place to ensure that at the end of the day, you know, continuity of operations continues if, in fact, we do see certain terminations or walk-offs um, in critical workforce sectors that could really have a, a, a detrimental impact on, on society. And certainly, you know, we, we realize that uh, you come from your, your own jurisdiction. So, you know, sort of having insights to that, but if any national snapshot thoughts you'd like to share, please feel free to do so as well. So AJ, let's turn to you first. All right, thank you. So um, here in Arkansas, we've, uh, we've, we've haven't really seen a big impact from the mandatory vaccines and, and for a couple of reasons for that as as one especially for our healthcare facilities we haven't reached that deadline yet that some of them have set up so a lot of this is remains to be seen on what that impact will be i know some of the predictions from our department of health is they're 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 not anticipating they don't think there's going to be large walk-offs or, or anything of that nature um but again, those those deadlines are, are still uh, a few weeks off, so that, that remains to be seen. I know in some of the, the conversations with uh, that our Department of Health and, and we've had with uh, businesses and, and so forth is, you know, when they're when they're talking about mandatory or thinking about mandatory vaccination and balancing that or comparing that to, you know, is you know, are they going to lose some of their workforce by having mandatory vaccinations? Or, you know, the, the flip side of that is, is if, they're, if they're not vaccinated and then they have an outbreak or somebody's exposed and they have to start quarantining a good number of their uh, employees because they weren't vaccinated. So I know a, a lot of them are looking at that. Um, we also do have some, some legislation that's out there in our state that I won't go into too much on, but it hasn't gone into effect yet, uh, but has an impact on some of those mandatory um, vaccinations but uh but again we you know we haven't reached those deadlines with with those 
businesses, those health services. Um, yet I know uh, just today I was reading an article about our national airport that uh, they've got a date of December 8th uh, for mandatory vaccinations. Uh, just saw that today. Today, So um, it'll be interesting. We'll be watching that to, to see uh, how that pans out. They did say in that article that that they were over 70% vaccinated. So, you know, that was pretty good to hear. So there may, it may not be a big impact there, but again, that remains to be seen. Great, yeah, AJ, thank you. Laquandra, you know, from sort of the state of affairs from the District of Columbia or the National Capital Region, um, what are you seeing and feeling? We um, observed very quickly, and I think, you know, uh, Chris has mentioned this as well, is that our, our general population was doing a very good job of getting vaccinated. You know, President Biden had mentioned goals about what proportion of the population should, he wanted to see receive at least one dose by the 4th of July. I mean, we sailed past those, those metrics. And uh, we were seeing that we had certain members of critical parts of the workforce, healthcare workers, uh, so, certain members of our uh, education community uh, who were not moving as quickly as we would have liked them to uh, to protect uh, those who could not be vaccinated or who were vulnerable. And so we moved to uh, put a vaccine requirement in place for our uh, government employees. Uh, that one did have a testing option and it still does. Uh, and so the mayor issued that one. Uh, under my authority, we have a healthcare worker uh, requirement and it is for both unlicensed and licensed health professionals uh, working in the District of Columbia. Uh, and then the uh, mayor's uh, government employee one was modified so that uh, anyone working in a school setting, whether it be public schools, private schools, uh, charter schools, no longer had the option to do weekly testing. Uh, so all of those um, requirements are in place and a number of our large businesses also have vaccine requirements. Uh, we have not seen uh, where um, we have had many employers who have lost staff. Uh, as a result um, of putting these vaccine requirements in place. Um, for our healthcare worker requirement, we are in a phase of uh, what we call compliance validation, mm -hmm. uh, which with health professional licensing, I think uh, many of you would uh, understand that that uh, process uh, because of the legal implications of it, when we are going to restrict your license, um, we don't have a required time frame that we have to give you to come into compliance, but we do because of the notification tools that we use that remind people that they have to report, they have to validate their status, um, that we're giving people an opportunity to do that um, past our deadline of effectiveness, which was September 30th. Um, what we noticed was that there was an exorbitant use of religious exemption. Uh, so we had a, the highest proportion of people who were unvaccinated uh, claimed religious exemption. And it did not, uh, for the most part, meet a strongly held belief. Uh, it was simply, uh, I choose to have a religious exemption. Uh, so um, as our team are, are reviews those requests for an exemption, they're often uh, giving people an opportunity to submit additional information before it's denied. Uh, but we, for those that have been not denied, we're seeing people come into compliance. Uh, we have not seen any of our healthcare organizations have to dismiss large swaths of folks. Our greatest vulnerability is in our home and community-based services, home health aides, um, folks who are working in that uh, employee group. We have less vulnerability in our law and in in, uh, inpatient or hospital-based services, less vulnerability there. Uh, less concern for them having to dismiss a high proportion of their workforce and less vulnerability in our emergency medical services. That's a huge conversation that is happening nationally about what to do with first responders. Our first responder EMS community is included in our healthcare worker uh, requirement. And um, the, by the first deadline, over 80% of them uh, reported compliance. And so I, I think that this is an, an extremely effective tool uh, I, uh, many of the national surveys uh, sl state only it's like 10% of the population won't get vaccinated under any circumstances, which means that there's still a lot of space to move people into vaccination if you put a requirement in place. You know, you know, excellent points. And thank you both for sharing. And it's, you know, it's, it, to me, it's not only the issue of um, ensuring sufficiency of services and quality services, but in many respects, it's leading by example. 
Um, you know, average folks, you know, look at, you know, men and women in uniform, no matter what the service branch or in healthcare, And, you know, it's it is significant um, to really see those types of numbers where not only they're they're protected, they're protecting their people they serve, but also they're setting an example. So thank you Absolutely. for sharing. Absolutely, Jim. And if I might add to that point, some of our um, hospital executives were concerned um, about their ability to be great role models um, and wanted to, with a great degree of confidence, be able to say to the patients that they serve that they were offering as best they could a safe environment uh, by having everyone who was in their, their building uh, be vaccinated, right? There's no, we all know that vaccines are highly effective. Nothing is 100%, but they were doing the best they could to, to create, uh, to reduce the risk of COVID uh, in their facility by ensuring that 100% of their workforce was vaccinated unless they, you know, had a contraindication. So really wanted to do that, uh, that service for anyone who was walking through their doors. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, let me turn to, to Lee and, and Chris, um, and I want to spend a few moments talking about effective communications and managing dis and misinformation. Uh, we certainly all know how damaging the proliferation of mis and dis and misinformation has been to our COVID-19 response efforts. Um, in mid-July, the U.S. Surgeon General issued an advisory on the urgent need to address the spread of dangerous health misinformation and signaled that clear urgent action is needed through a whole of society approach. Um, really, you know, if you could just take a few moments and share with us any approaches that you and your agency um, is taking, are taking, to really neutralize this harmful tactic. Um, and Lee, let's turn to you. Welcome. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, this has been a di different kind of disaster, and I'll be real curious what AJ says about this also with his deep um, experience in disaster management. You know, usually disasters unify a population. And if anything, this has been just the opposite of that. It's been something that has been very divisive. The, I think one of the things that we didn't pay enough attention to early on, I certainly know I and my agency did not, and that was the social psychology of this particular pandemic disaster. And it's really the first one where I've seen that had social media with such a profound influence on it. <clears throat> The, um, our approach has been pretty straightforward. We do not take misinformation and disinformation lying down. We feel it is our uh, responsibility to put out the best quality information that we can uh, really portray to get it out there. We want it to be uh, messaging that's by relevant people. Uh, and to understand that we did a, and have continuously done a lot of research all along the way with who do people listen to? Who do people hold in high regard in terms of their opinion? And it, from very early on, we recognized it wasn't some of the usual uh, um, sources of information that we had depended on traditionally. We, as a physician and a scientist, we've, I've always thought if we can talk straight talk with people that the light will go on and, and, and then it will become understood and, and adopted. This has been something other than that. Science has been kicked to the curb. Uh, early on, and we've had a hard time recovering. So relevant deliverers of the information, uh, very much gender, race, ethnicity, language specific, the language appropriateness is really critical. And even the nuances in the language is really critical uh, and reading level appropriate. I mean, all these things might be blinding flashes of the obvious for many people, but we, I think, had a few cultural and language missteps that could have been done um, better earlier. And finally, a couple of things. Graphics and diagrams work very well for some people and not so well for others. I personally don't like cartoony looking things that tend to, I think, kind of tend to denigrate a serious image or a serious message, but everybody learns differently. And as part of our continuous market research, if you will, especially with the unvaccinated or the people who are delaying vaccine was really uh, important to find out through focus groups or research uh, surveys, what will you listen to? What would, it, what would make you change your mind, if anything? Mm -hmm. And then finally, testimonials. One of the things that we, uh, unfortunately, there's no shortage of testimonials uh, now in our state and in every state. Uh, but that does touch a lot of people. So I think that in summary, what is the social psychology underpinnings and then how do people learn? And then to Laquandra's point, uh, there's 
uh, a lot of people that are going to be very recalcitrant uh, in terms or reluctant, perhaps I should say, to change their mind. But uh, I think we have to keep uh, coming at it from these many different attitudes. Yeah, yeah excellent point. And AJ, before before I come to you to, to sort of uh, layer on uh, to Lee's point, you know, Chris, um, you know, from the school environment, you know, interacting with with faculty, rank and file, um, you know, parents who certainly want to do the right thing, and they often, if not always, turn to school leaders and administrators for, um, you know, valid, credible informa information. So please share with us your experiences and some of your strategies and tactics to sort of, um, you know, set the record straight on the facts of the issue. Yeah, thank you. And as Dr. Norman said, this is a pretty unique environment like <laughs> perhaps we've never seen in any sort of crisis in the era of monetizing fear through social media platforms and media channels it's just a different combatant we've got a dual challenge of a virus and then we've got an information campaign we've never had to sort of do those at the same time because prior crises generally unified the country they unified the region i still think some of those values can hold up uh, but as Dr. Norman said, uh, what we have certainly found in our state is trusted sources matter a lot um, and localizing it matters a lot. Uh, there's just too much social science research that continues to remind us that when the federal government says it, it has less trust than when a state says it. And it has less trust than when a local official says it. When a local pediatrician says it, it has a whole lot more power than anybody else. And so what we found is Getting the right folks to talk, not just as individuals, but as associations, built confidence. Um, the other thing I would say is we tend to think, I think, particularly in the public sector space where our job is fundamentally defending the rights and, uh, and privileges of the people that we serve, we tend to think that's a presumption. So we go after tactical things like deploying vaccines or uh, you know, making sure that we uh, navigate this through the mechanics of safety and I think sometimes we drop the ball in communication. There's an entire force of negativity out there and misinformation. And I think what we would learn from this a lot is constantly being intentional about the positives. Uh, when we say to folks, 80% uh, of Washingtonians are nearly vaccinated, that's a good thing. Nearly 90% of educators in our state are now vaccinated. That's a really good thing. That tends to build more momentum and trust then constantly reminding the 10 or 20% why they need to get vaccinated. That's important, but there's only so many negative frames that are going to carry the day. There's a lot of people waiting to look around and say, people I trust like teachers and people in the private sector uh, that I believe in are doing this and they're having success. That's as important of a story. And I think sometimes we don't share enough about uh, what's positive and going on. Um, lastly, uh, as this thing continues to unfold, we are gonna to have to evidence for folks uh, that it mattered. So when the misinformation of breakthrough cases, for example, has people concluding, why did I get vaccinated? It didn't matter, people got sick anyways. It's because we didn't follow through enough with, and that vaccination got hospitalization rates down. Hundreds of thousands of Americans are alive today because we vaccinated. It's time to pivot the conversation to how vaccinations can keep us more safe not whether or not they keep us from getting infected, but, but being quick and responsive in information is, is got to be more intentional because the other side of this is 24 seven, multiple channels and platforms trying to, to misinform. So we gotta be more intentional. Yep, you know, excellent points and recommendations. And, and I'd like to invite AJ and LaQuandra to, to add your thoughts on this. Sure, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Norman for bringing that up. Um, so just like our, what I'll call our normal disasters that we have every year in pre-pandemic, um, during the pandemic, we implemented the Joint Information Center. So we had a lot of our media from different uh, agencies all working in one room, working together on, on getting the message out, getting the correct message out. So everybody was, was speaking uh, that same message. Um, in addition to that, from, from day one, our, our governor was really big on talking uh, talking to the public and getting that information out. So we went from, from daily, uh, you know, press briefings about the pandemic when the vaccines came out, really pushed that information out, and including going around the state with uh, not only the director of, of the Department of Health, but also the, the health experts and did town hall meetings out in the, in the community so that people could go to those, go to those meetings and, and ask their questions of the experts. And with them were some of the local uh, leaders within the community and, and also some of the local, uh, 
you know, medical providers from there in that community. So that really helped, I think, to get that message out because they were hearing it from their community leaders, not at the state level, but in addition to the state level, to, to their neighbors, to people right there living in their community. So um, I think that did, went a long ways to getting the, the right messages out. Great, thank you. So thank you. Yeah. And, and, you know, J Jim, we've done similar things and uh, really capitalizing on the strength of community champions uh, where we created toolkits to train clergy uh, and to have clergy serving as ambassadors, working with our medical society similarly, uh, creating a clinician's champion program that is set effectively served as a, uh, the ability for members of the public to not only bring out uh, folks from the health department, but to be able to grab community clinicians to come to community town hall meetings and to be able to uh, answer questions that the public had. Uh, we had a youth advisory council. Uh, so we had young people talk to other young people uh, about COVID, not just for vaccines, but the risk of COVID more broadly, uh, and have uh, mobilized a pretty broad uh, community core, uh, partnering with community-based organizations that um, have different um, uh, foci. So uh, the LGBTQ community, um, working with the Latinx community. So really being able to mobilize champions who um, weren't just interested in doing something about COVID, but who really wanted to learn um, facts uh, and being able to ask questions to be able to dispel myths in the community uh, so that they can engage very effectively uh, with their peers and, at, at, and have a really good ground game. Because, uh, you know, we could do all of the sharing accurate information we wanted to, uh, but if the trust wasn't there for us as an honest broker, um, we needed to be able to mobilize other people to act as our agents uh, to be able to get people to, um, to move to action, whether we're talking about accepting vaccines or wearing masks or social distancing or um, some of the more basic and fundamental disease prevention strategies like staying home when you're sick. Uh, getting people just to do those things. Yeah, you know, excellent. You know, on a, on a personal note, Laquandra, you know, because of the pandemic and working from home, and I live in New Jersey, I haven't been in, have not been in D.C. in about 18, 19 months. So I'm not benefiting from watching your materials on, you know, Washington, D.C. television. But I do see that from the New York City area. And I have to say, your colleagues in New York City have done an outstanding job in their public service announcements and their messaging. And I'm sure that level of competence and confidence and accuracy um, is, is being replicated around the country. So just taking this opportunity to really recognize and give a shout out to uh, many of the city and county health agencies that are really on the ground doing this work every day. So thank you. The, the last targeted topic we wanna to discuss is that of force health protection, which I think we'd all agree is paramount. Um, how are we caring for and protecting our own um, who are exhausted, burning out, and threatened by the public that they are trying to protect? You know, examples are numerous. And I mean, just going through my, you know, my library uh, earlier today, you know, in August 2020, the National Governors Association was compelled to issue a detailed memo entitled Prevention of Targeted Violence and Terrorism Against Public Health Assets. Who would ever thought such a doc doctrine would have to be developed? And, and more recently, two weeks ago, letters from professional associations were sent to the U.S. Attorney General requesting Department of Justice intervention to address threats to school administrators, board members, and public health officials. And this situation is also chronicled um, in a recent New York Times article entitled Threats, Resignations, and 100 New Laws, Why Public Health is in Crisis. Um, so, you know, with that, AJ, turning to you, from a Homeland Security and public safety perspective, you know, please share with us um, your thoughts on this from your, from, your, from your profession, from your experience, and, and what is Arkansas experiencing and reacting to in this way? Sure. So, um, you know, some of the things, is, especially with everything that's going on, is uh, the importance and even pre, you know, going back a few years, the importance of making sure that our that our teams that, that uh, you know, they're healthy, they're getting the, the resources they need to stay healthy. Um, some of the things that, that, that we've done and the Department of Health has done is, is just, you know, encouraging people to take that time off that they have to, to not get to that burnout stage, um, to take the time off uh, on a regular basis. 
Um, even some of the things through the Department of Health are doing some monthly stress release relief uh, classes. Some of those live recorded, just try to try to make things a little bit better. Um, and of course, encouraging the EAP and other health insurance to to help them get the the, the help the help that they need. Um, the Department of Public Safety we we started a health wellness team uh, a while back, so they they really focus on you know taking care of our team members. Um, throughout the throughout the organization and and the different divisions within the Department of, of Safety, um, and uh, you know set up to where especially for law enforcement that we have that uh, crisis intervention that crisis counseling when something happens that that uh, we have those resources available to them um, so that they can you know get the help that they need on the front end so it so it doesn't get bad. Um, I'm a I'm a retired police chief. Uh, when I was a police chief, uh, we went to or we had a, a 12 hour schedule. So it was two days on, two days off, three days on, three days off. And everybody had that every other three day weekend off. So that gave them the opportunity to spend that time with their family, at least, uh, especially even the most you know, rookie officer got that time with their family. Uh, we also implemented some uh, the ability for them to actually get uh, physical fitness while on duty. So we gave them extra time to hit the gym there at the police department on those 12 hour shifts so that they could, you know, relieve some of that stress there in the gym um, and keep their health up. And, and we actually saw a, a pretty good turnaround in that agency for, for the health of, uh, of our staff and our team. So, so that was, that was tremendous. Uh, obviously, you know, everybody knows it's a huge strain on law enforcement right now. Uh, we're seeing, uh, uh, low numbers uh, turn out for uh, applying for positions in law enforcement. And uh, we've seen a lot of incentives out. So, uh, um, you know, we're, we're just continuing to, to try new things and, and, and try to make that better for our team. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Lee, turning to you, um, you know, last week you moderated so skillfully a leadership insights and inspiration program for ASTO which featured Sebastian Younger on the lead on, on the title of leading in public health, COVID-19 and PTSD in the workforce. You know, during this session, um, you shared some very personal experiences and insights on, on individual and staff mental health wellness. You know, could you spend a few moments and just share some of your top line thoughts on this and how you were working to care for those under your command, so to speak? Yeah, sure. Happy to. And, and by the way, I, I, uh, what AJ talked about, I think, are just brilliant approaches. I think we've learned a lot coming out of police forces, healthcare workforce, and the military. Um, I've, I've got over 20 years in the military between my Air Force and now Army. I'm a colonel in the United States Army, currently the state surgeon in Kansas. So I have two obligations overarching. One is uh, medical care and force health protection, uh, meaning behavioral health, mental health, and the like. Um, I had just come back from a 2017, 2018 uh, year long deployment um, in 2018. And I thought, well, I'll become a state health officer and a secretary of KDHE. How hard can that be uh, unless a pandemic or something comes along? And, uh, but I brought back the, the preparation and, and, and uh, in terms of thinking how to organize a warlike effort really, because we are at war with this uh, pathogen, but also how do you take care of your troops? And I think that, uh, it would. So I did read Sebastian Younger's book, uh, and Younger is J U N G E R, by the way. Uh, Tribe, a little skinny read, um, but I and reading it in a combat region deployed, it is particularly poignant. But he talks about three or four things that, by the way, I've always believed, but he crystallized the thoughts on it, I think, better than I had in the past. One is uh, in, in a run-up to any kind of a, a, um, an emergency, a disaster, we want people to be competent. That's what preparedness is all about. And one of the things we do know is that people that are competent in their roles, in their jobs, well-trained, and have the resources to do are less likely to have uh, post-traumatic stress and the disorder attached to that. When, and we've seen it, of course, uh, in our, our own state of Kansas and sure, uh, surely every jurisdiction, we have 105 counties. We've had a 40% turnover in our, our administrators and our uh, county health officers. So this is not a trivial concern. Uh, we've seen similar numbers in hospitals and, and health systems. One, we cannot allow our people to get isolated and especially 
to Chris's earlier point about uh, social media and misinformation, we do not, to have a person get off their job for the day, go to the basement, sit at a computer and read social media attacking them is not a good strategy. Mm -hmm. So one, I think it's really important to work on deliberate strategies to not become isolated, to do frequent check-ins. We call them battle buddies. Uh, we don't make a formal assignments. People are grownups and but, but I think it's really critical to when we see each other at in incident command or in the hallway or, or even online, um, I think it's really important to say, hey, how you doing? And then they say, oh, great. And, and, I, and then to say, no, I'm serious. I'm not just being social here. I want to know how you're doing because I think you're a little bit off, quite honestly. And can we talk about that? And some of them will tell me to take a flying leap. And other ones will say, yeah, you're right. Uh, let's talk about that. And the third one is, and this is, will emphasize AJ's point, uh, and it is so much in the ethos of our agency and what I try to help in my own uh, army troops for that matter is martyrdom is highly overrated. Mm -hmm. and, the, and what I mean by that is we have to actively do the schedule like AJ talked about so that people have three days off so they can get down and do their workouts or but not to just let nature take its course because people are martyrs by nature, especially in these, in education, in, in so many of the sectors that we're talking about, people tend towards martyrdom and we have to structure, and that's our job as leaders is to structure something where martyrdom is not acceptable and to best avoid it. Thank, thank you for sharing those, those, those real world examples um, and, and how you're applying that in your agency. So thank you. You know, our, you know, unfortunately, our time is, is flying by, and I do have a series of, of additional questions, but I am going to pose one more because we do want to give the audience an opportunity to, uh, to contribute. So, and, and you all know that I'm going to ask this question of you, so, and, and I really would ask all four of you to sort of contribute. Um, you know, so I think you would all agree that, you know, there, there is that $64,000 question out there that so many people are asking, you know, how long will this pandemic last? or what is our end game strategy? I mean, clearly that's not a simple question to answer, but it's so important and it's so on everyone's mind. You know, so if, if your mayor, governor or significant other, other asked you that question, you know, in a few moments or a few minutes or less, you know, what would be those main takeaways or key points that you would want to share that would suggest or signal or be a goal for the purposes of, of transitioning from acute, an acute crisis pandemic response to something that's more endemic and steady state going forward. So Dr. Nesbitt, let me start with you. We'll go to Chris, AJ, and then Lee. You know, Jim, you said it exactly right. You know, I, I have already started uh, saying to people COVID is endemic. Uh, and I've started giving them examples when they say, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, there was this outbreak at a hotel where there were 37 cases and people who worked at this hotel and 36 of them were fully vaccinated. And a lot of these people came to work when they were sick and they spread it to their other coworkers. So we really need people to stay home if they're sick, right? And, and, and then making sure people understood, but the benefits is that they were all fully vaccinated. So they all didn't end up in the ICU, intubated in the hospital, right? So, but getting people to understand that what we're going to do here is move through the pandemic phases, right? The pre-pandemic to, you know, preparedness, to response, to recovery, to preparedness, planning, all of those things all over again. Uh, and whether or not you're talking about the different, you know, acceleration, deceleration, accelerate, we've gone through those waves three times, mm -hmm. and we're hoping to not have to do that a fourth time. But, but I think it's that sort of coaching people through the shift of, we're probably not going to get to a place where we're posting zero cases of COVID-19, but we're doing surveillance in a very different way, in the same way that we do surveillance for other respiratory pathogens where we're looking for alerts that may tell us that we're not just thinking about this as the endemic, the endemic aspect of COVID-19, but where we may be on the verge of an epidemic or a pandemic again, right? So when do we call it? When do we say we're out of having to do mitigation strategies and having everyone wear a mask and telling people they have to social distance and reducing the capacity of 
of, you know, ballparks and movie theaters and all of those things and moving life back to the new normal, I, I think are the decision points that we have to make from a moral and ethical perspective. But moving away from thinking we're going to count every single case of COVID-19, right? So what does the new surveillance system look like? And how do we make sure that people get away from this notion that we're going to get to zero? Because uh, I think that that that's probably um, a foregone conclusion if we're really being honest with ourselves. Yep, Ex excellent points. Yeah, I'll okay. only add. Oh, oh, Chris, I'm sorry, Chris. Yeah, I'll, I'll only add that hope is a function of vision. And in the first phases of this, people's vision and expectation was we were going to stomp it out, and then we'd get to our, our normal lives. And and the in the dissonance between that reality crushed hope. This was the first time, unlike a giant hurricane or a winter storm, where there's a phase, there's a cleanup, we know it ends, it moves on, we can recover. What we had to keep saying to people through all of this is we don't know, and we still don't know the ultimate end, but it, it's certainly, as Dr. Nesbitt said, time to be very clear, folks aren't already with their communities. This is something we're going to live with. We're going to mitigate it, though, through vaccination strategies. We've got to keep that message going. There might be seasonal reasons to wear face coverings. We're still going to have a hygiene awareness and an air quality awareness that we have not had for decades. And then again, celebrate the hope. <laughs> a year and a half ago, we were absolutely wiped out. We were all at home. Businesses were failing. We were economically in distress. Uh, we saw equity markets plummeting. We saw all kinds of folks hit hospitals, we were racing towards that first 400,000 in death count. It is significantly better today because of what we have done together. We are taking care of our fellow Americans by watching our distancing and wearing our face coverings and taking our vaccinations as needed. Pairing hope with the responsibility we all have is the message I think that carries us now. We've got to get away from, oh, when it ends, we'll let you know and life will be normal. This is normal. It's just going to get better and better. And we've evidenced that for the last year. Yeah, very powerful way to, to characterize that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, AJ. Yeah, so not too much to add. I mean, I agree with that. Um, I, you know, I actually had on some of my notes and thoughts, uh, Dr. Nesbitt, that when you said new normal, and I think that's it, I, you know, we're never going to get back to that normal pre-pandemic stage, but we'll, we'll be in a new normal. And, you know, for emergency management, I mean, we, our other disasters didn't stop when, when, when COVID started, we still had our floods, we still had our tornadoes that we were, we were dealing with. And we've kind of gotten into this, uh, you know, this battle rhythm where, 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 you know, we're going along and, and, and the, the COVID resources that we have to, you know, pull in from time to time is just kind of a, it's kind of that new normal for us. So uh, um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that, uh, that uh, things are going, you know, things are going good. And, and, uh, but I think we're always going to have these cases out there. Um, so I, I agree. Great. Thank you. And Lee. Um, really two, two thoughts. One is that I think it's really critical uh, to Chris's point that we celebrate successes because when you think about it, my goodness, we have been immensely successful in saving thousands of lives. I mean, we have a hard time proving that to everybody, but we've been immensely successful. The other thing is, is that a lot of times people, and I, I'm in a very red state here, that looks at a continuum of how much freedom do I have and how much am I controlled? And I think one of the things that we've tried to do is change that narrative and to say, how much freedom do you have and how much safety do you have? Because yeah, you, you want, you can want to be free, go live off the grid and cut your own trees. Oh, but you need a supply chain to bring you flour. Oh, you need electricity. You actually want electric. You have some dependencies as opposed to the other end around safety. Uh, you want to be safe. Oh, you put on a mask, live in the basement, uh, breathe uh, purified air or some, get vaccinated and everything. What I think is really important is a message that you can be safe and get more freedom. And that is called vaccine. And I think that's one of the things that really will be the great liberator uh, is uh, if people would really embody that. Because what I consider a success is for somebody to say, Norman, I hate you, but I've decided to get the vaccine because I'm, I want to be more free. And that's, that's called a victory, an high five, and yep. then hand washing. <laughs> 
<laughs> Great thoughts from all of you. So, so thank you. And I certainly hope our audience uh, can, and I know that they fully appreciate and will have a lot of takeaways on some of those um, specific thoughts. So Donna, I know our time is running short, but I do see that there are a number of questions in queue. Can I turn to you and ask you to sort of uh, tee up maybe one or two for the panel? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Jim. And I know that you're going to pose a, a closing question to all of our panelists about their recommendations to their colleagues out around the country. So I'll just summarize uh, a theme of several questions that have come in here and, and ask each panelist to quickly mention what is keeping you up at night right now, looking into the fall, into the winter, everything from workforce issues to a flu season that's going to come in tandem with a, a multi-month COVID-19 response. What's the one issue that your city, the district, your state, your leaders are looking at and, and you're really looking into? Jim, I'll turn it to you to, to, to each of our panelists. Yeah, thanks, Dawn. And again, I know I know we are running out of time. So maybe to ask all the panelists, as you're reflecting on that question, maybe if you sort of want to weave in your, your, your closing thought or recommendation uh, for the audience for the short and the long term as far as uh, how to be in a better state of readiness for this myriad health threats that we're, we're dealing with. So Lee, well, let, well, let's reverse our order here. We'll, well, let's go Lee, Chris, AJ, and LaQuandra. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, I think, first off, I'm not easily kept awake at night, but if I were to be, it would be around a, a new variant or variants coming that we uh, find to be enough different that they pose a whole new threat. When you think back to June and July, there was getting to be a glimmer of hope and, uh, and we were starting to kind of uh, probably open up a little bit too soon, but feeling terrific relief. Um, we can manage vaccines, we can manage testing, we can manage schools, um, but a new variant I think would be a curveball that I would rather not see. So that's really my closing comments, Jim. Thank you. Chris. A new variant combined with labor shortages. Um, it's tough everywhere, every sector, every part of the country is facing this. We knew this baby boom retirement wave would come. COVID has expedited that for those down to age 60. Uh, we thought we had a few more years, we don't. So I get really nervous that I don't have enough paraeducators, teachers, building administrators, bus drivers. That's gonna persist for a long time. And, and ironically, that has a whole lot of impact um, on our ability to mitigate a lot of uh, COVID in schools, right? These are people doing contact tracing right now. And when we get you know, high quality folks who do the work with Fidelity, we get better outcomes. So definitely worried about the labor shortages right now. Yeah, and I, I'm sure you have a lot of people that agree with you as well as Lee, you know, the, the human infrastructure is, is equally is fragile. So thank you. AJ. Yeah, real quick. So so I agree the the problems with the supply chain, whatever, whatever that's caused by, or whatever continues to be caused by, and then also a, a, a large cyber event on top of that that will even make those things worse. Um, the, the things that Chris mentioned, and and real quick, just uh, you know, a couple of takeaways. I, I think we're we're better prepared now because of the pandemic. I know we have we have built up uh, better capacity at our Department of Health with with uh, additional experts to help uh, to build everything and the relationships that 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 we have built even beyond that and the ability to pull all of these people together to to put together um logistics teams because we had to purchase our own you know ppe for a while at the height of the the pandemic and bring these supplies in so you know i think we're, we're much better prepared for the for the future because we have shown that these relationships that we built beforehand really worked out and we were able to pull everybody together to get to the final goal Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. And LaQuandra. I, I, I sleep pretty well like Lee. Um, it, it, you know, after 20 months, you just got to sleep, you know. Um, but I, I think the human capital piece for me is the part that's the most challenging. Uh, trying to continue to uh, have the right amount of technical and subject matter experts who also have the heart um, for public service uh, and the ability to do the type of work that needs to be done with the right degree of professional integrity and compassion uh, is becoming increasingly challenging uh, when there is so much uh, uh, an increasing lack of appreciation and respect uh, for the work that has to be done and is being done. So it's the human capital piece for me that um, I uh, have the greatest area of concern for at this point. Yeah, you know, you know, so well said by all four of you. And and 
you know, we often have heard and said, you know, public service is a noble profession. Um, you know, and I would argue no matter what sector you're from, it's the noblest of professions. Um, and I think that is going to be a rough road ahead for all the reasons that you all have articulated. So, Dawn, I, I believe our time has come to a close. So allow me first to thank, you know, A.J. LaQuandra, Chris and Lee for such a great job uh, being our panel today. Um, and I will turn the program back to you for closure. Thank you, Jim. And another thank you to our esteemed panel today. A final thank you on behalf of our co-host today, the Naval Postgraduate School Alumni Association and Foundation, the CHDS Alumni Association, and our colleagues at ASTO, IAEM, NEMA, and NGA. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to having you with us again at future programs. <laughs>